Okay, welcome everybody. I'm glad you are here. Instead of uh, frying your brain outside, we will fry your brain with uh, Old Greek, Plato. Uh, but I can promise you, he also has some, some inner sunshine to give to us. So let's see if we can uh, talk about that today. Um, welcome all to the Blavatsky House. My name is Erwin Bomas. And before I start my presentation, a short intro also for, also for the viewers from um, uh, outside the Netherlands on our organization uh, and uh, yeah, who we are and how this uh, afternoon will take place. Uh, we are here at the Blavatsky House in The Hague. And this is also the residence of the international headquarters of the Theosophical Society Point Loma. And this society was founded in 1875 by Madame Blavatsky uh, for the sole purpose of compassion. We spread knowledge about the laws of nature from the perspective of science, philosophy and religion. And this knowledge uh, leads to the realization of universal brotherhood in the widest sense of the word. It is what theosophists are trying to practice every day in their daily lives. And this knowledge is the heritage of man, lies more or less latent within all of us and can be developed by each and every one of us. So we therefore ask always all our visit visitors and watchers to think for themselves and to test all that is said here before accepting it and to practice these ideas uh, to value their worth. This presentation uh, will be uh, divided in three parts. Uh, there is time for questions after each part, uh, but also in between, if there's anything unclear, just uh, ask. We have a short break in between, uh, and we end this presentation at about uh, a quarter past four with the Gayatri from the Rig Veda, a call to our higher self, seven strokes of the gong, and silence. So now the presentation of today. Uh, to start with, the most important message of Plato, before I forget, is that all this suffering in this world is due to ignorance, and that the solution for that is true knowledge or wisdom. Because Plato says true knowledge equals virtue. And the essence of this knowledge, the Theosophia, uh, literally meaning divine wisdom, has been taught for ages and is still taught in the mystery schools. In Plato, it is still veiled behind myth and metaphor. And we will talk about later why that was uh, hidden behind veils. Since 1875, a lot more of this knowledge that has been previously only within the, with, in, in secrecy uh, taught in the mystery schools, uh, more of this knowledge has become public with the work of Madame Blavatsky and also her uh, successors. So it is very interesting with that knowledge to go back to Plato and study him again. And that's also because of a lot of correspondences of the Greek time at the time of Plato with also today. Think for instance of the struggles of um, finding a just constitution, a constitution, a state based on justice, within a democratic or maybe another system. But also Plato has a lot to add to us in a time of fake news and filter bubbles. So uh, this is what I uh, would like to talk about this afternoon. We are going to uh, look again, of course, who was Plato, a bit of biographical information. And then we will see what he has to say, for instance, about truth. Uh, about justice and the ideal state. Uh, we will also, of course, talk about uh, a mystery school. Plato was a founder of such a mystery school. And we end with Plato's lessons to find the good. So, to start with, who was Plato? He was born in Athens and lived from about uh, 427 before Christ until 347 before Christ. So he has uh, had a respectable age of, uh, of 80 years he reached. Uh, his real name was uh, Aristocles, 
but we know him still as Plato because he seems to have had such a broad forehead, and Plato means the broad in Greek. He was born in a distinguished Athenian arist aristocratic family, and um, actually uh, when he was born, it was the same year that the uh, famous statesman Pericles, the Athenian Pericles, died, and uh, Greece was then in war with Sparta, and those were two competing uh, cities. And uh, at that time, uh, when Plato was young, he had some relatives that were into politics, and Athens was just defeated by Sparta, and there was a, um, a rule, there were uh, 30 people, amongst which the, these relatives of Plato, um, that seized the reign of Athens. Um, and Plato was uh, still young, and he thought, well, uh, they asked him also to come in to, to, to work with them to rule Athens. But he thought, well, uh, let's see first what they, uh, what they intend to do. Uh, are, they, do they, uh, are they going to make the city more just? Uh, but instead, he saw that there was a lot of self-interest, uh, and, and indeed, later, this... Uh, um, the, these rulers were also known uh, by the name of the 30 tyrants because they really had um, uh, a reign of terror, so to say. And they, they were, uh, all the opposers, they were uh, prosecuted and brought to death. So Plato thought, well, politics, that's not my, uh, <laughs> my thing, and uh, decided to, um, to um, uh, focus on different things. Uh, he also was, of course, famous uh, as a pupil of Socrates. And when the, um, these 30 tyrants after this year uh, reign of terror were defeated and um, the Democrats came into power, uh, Plato thought, well, maybe this uh, will lead to something good. But also these Democrats were very self-interested and they also prosecuted Socrates. And then Plato thought, well, um, I'm, I'm out of here. Uh, he went uh, uh, away from Athens and went to travel, amongst others, uh, to Egypt and also to Italy. And in Egypt, he also came in co contact with the Egyptian uh, mystery teachings. And in Italy, he met uh, the Pythag Pythagoreans and uh, learned about uh, uh, Pythagoras and his teachings. He came then back to Athens and founded the uh, academy in 387. Uh, and he also uh, was uh, next to his interests and teachings in philosophy, uh, also became an advisor temporarily in Sicily of uh, Dionysius II. I will talk about that later. So this is a short sketch of Plato's life. Of course, he is uh, um, in a line of um, uh, Greek philosophers. Uh, he was influenced by uh, several philosophers. And at that time, there were uh, two main directions. There was the Ionian school at the one side and the Iliatic school at the other side. And Thales of Milete is a famous person from the Ionic school, Ionian school and Parmenides from the Eleatic school. And then Heraclitus and Pythagoras were also two famous philosophers that had much influence on Plato. These, all these people were looking into nature and what the essence of being was. And in the Ionian school, they looked more or less more to the outer world and they described it as something that is cons constantly transitory. And they said, well, maybe in the matter we can find the essence of things. So Thales said this is, uh, the essence is water. Another said the essence is air. Uh, there was another, he, he said the, the, this is something boundless, but then uh, on the outer side. But um, it's not pure materialistic. They also thought all matter was... Um, <coughs> What they, what they said, full of gods. Everything is full of gods. So they, they thought it also as something spiritual. And then you have the Iliatic school, 
which uh, 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 Parmenides is a famous one, and they said, well, it's not in the outer world, there is something working behind this world, some unity, and that unity can only be understood by using your faculty of thought, by thinking. So uh, they said, don't find it here, it's somewhere else. Uh, and then you have uh, Heraclitus, who is very famous for, for his um, uh, saying, Pantarai, that everything is constantly flowing, transitory. He also said, you cannot enter a river twice, because when you enter for the second time, it's a different river. So everything is constantly flowing and transitory. And, uh, of course, you have Pythagoras, um, who had a lot of uh, influence also uh, from the Eastern philosophy. He was also, um, uh, yeah, he was um, in what they called Little Asia. Uh, I don't know if that's the right name. In uh, Minor Asia, thank you. Minor Asia. So he was also in contact with these Eastern philosophers. And you, you also see in his teachings the immortality f of the soul, for instance, uh, reincarnation, uh, but of course also um, his uh, emphasis on arithmetics and his whole teachings about numbers uh, and also a lot of emphasis on ethics. So another uh, big influence also on the, um, the thinking of Plato. And to end with, of course, the mysteries, we will go into that more later. And Plato also uh, influenced a lot of people, of course. Um, uh, first of all, in, in Greece, but uh, that was for about a thousand years before the academy was closed. Uh, and then you had the Neoplatonics, Ammoniosacus, Plotinus are um, important uh, names in the, these schools, they worked out Plato's ideas more in a cosmology also. Um, when the school was closed in uh, the sixth century uh, of this age, uh, the last philosophers also went to the Middle East and they had a lot of influence on Islam. They also founded a school in Baghdad, for instance. And uh, through Islam, also came back the teachings of Plato to uh, in the, at the time of the Renaissance, at the end of the Middle Ages, when they started to translate Plato again from Latin of into Latin, from Greek into Latin, and Pico della Mirandola and uh, Marsilio Ficino are uh, those people who were very uh, had a big influence by their um, studies into Plato and then working that out and starting the Renaissance. And also uh, Western philosophy, there are many ideas from Plato that um, were still uh, worked out in Western philosophy. And actually one philosopher, Whitehead, said that the safest general characterizations of the European philosophical, philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes on Plato. So Western philosophy actually um, hasn't much to add to all these big themes that Plato already um, used and worked out. So we know Plato from his, uh, his dialogues. Um, they are um, quite some uh, number of dialogues um, that uh, we inherited. And they are generally uh, divided in three periods, early, middle, and late period. And you can ask yourself, why did Plato write dialogues? It's not a very common form. It also wasn't at the time a very uh, common form. Uh, but it also says something about what Plato wants to uh, teach us. And he is convinced that, what well, I started also this lecture with, is that this knowledge can be found within ourselves. And actually by writing dialogues, um, you don't find these teachings in a, like you could say, opposing form. This is how it is, this is uh, what you should understand. No, it's, you have to really read between the lines, uh, you have to follow different perspectives, 
Um, and um, uh, yeah, it, it makes you curious when you follow these, these dialogues. What is Plato? What is his message? What does he want to say? So we must really think for ourselves uh, to discover this message when we read these dialogues. And of course, also these different perspectives. And many times these are also uh, philosophers from the, from the time. For instance, uh, Parmenides already mentioned. And also uh, you have uh, Protagoras, uh, known for um, his famous uh, saying that man is the measure of all things, uh, that everything is sort of relative. Well, you, you see in these perspectives still um, philosophies that are still used today, that are still valid and, and yeah, with arguments that we can recognize also in, uh, in our time. And if you uh, know more about um, the thinking aspects, we will go into this later, you can also discover that these partners in these dialogues also sometimes stand for some sort of thinking aspect. It's interesting to read it in that way. Okay, now let's get into what Plato has to say. And of course, um, uh, we will also attribute that to um, the problems of our time, uh, that to see if, is, if the message is still valid. So if we, if we talk about truth, then there is quite something to say about that if we uh, read the news. Um, we had, uh, of course, the American elections uh, not so long ago, and um, there was a lot of uh, fake news spreading then at that time in, uh, on Facebook. For instance, that uh, Pope Francis uh, would endorse Donald Trump, or that Hillary sold uh, 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 information to ISIS, etc., or weapons to ISIS. And uh, they discovered that many of these messages actually originated in a small village in Macedonia where there was an IT school with all these whiz kids actually earning money by making all these fake sites like world politics and USA uh, politics, etc. And then spreading uh, these messages and then earning uh, with uh, advertisements the, uh, the money. And um, just before elections, it, they uh, even saw that there were more people um, reading fake news messages than actually the real messages just before the election. So uh, the uh, CEO of Google, for instance, and other tech companies also said that, well, actually the spread of fake news could have... Um, swung the election in the United States. Well, of course, in, in Europe, we also see uh, some things. We had the Brexit campaign and uh, the Oxford Dictionary, the main English dictionary in England, um, elected the word post-truth as the word of the year, meaning that uh, we live in a post-truth era, um, that the the... the yeah, the emotional appeal to things is more important than real facts. And that is actually a characterization. So, maybe Plato can um, give us some antidote for this. In his uh, um, dialogue, Politeia, the state, he um, writes about what truth is. And he starts with, um, or he, he actually describes several metaphors and similes, and one of which is the simile of the sun. And he says when you want to uh, discover truth, then you might compare um, the faculty of seeing we have. We have our eyes, and with our eyes we can uh, perceive objects, and we can perceive those objects because of light uh, shining on these objects, and this has a source, which is the sun. And here he describes the world of what becomes, the outer world. Actually, what the Ionian school uh, put first, the phenomena. And he said that you can compare these four levels to the faculty of knowing. And the faculty of knowing um, uh, can uh, discern ideas uh, when the truth 
shines on these ideas, and the truth also has a source, and that source is the idea of the good. And then you describe the world of what is the intelligible world of the things that work behind the phenomena, the noumena. Now, it is very important, his mention of this idea of the good as the source of all things. And he writes the following um, things about the idea of the good. In Politeia, I will uh, read it out loud. So he writes, so that what gives truth to, th to the things known and the power to know to the knower is the form of the good. And though it is the cause of knowledge and truth, it is also an object of knowledge. Both knowledge and truth are beautiful things, but the good is other and more beautiful than they. In the visible realm, light and sight are rightly considered sun-like. But it is wrong to think that they are the sun. So here it is right to think of knowledge and truth as good-like, but wrong to think that either of them is the good. For the good is yet more prized. So he describes that behind everything is this idea of the good and that it's, it goes be above everything else. And there's another metaphor he uses to make that clear. And that is the famous metaphor of uh, the cave of Plato. And he describes uh, the human state of consciousness, the, yeah, the, the, uh, how, how we think, as, um, as prisoners being chained in a cave, a subterraneous cave, with an entrance expanding uh, to the light, and these prisoners, these are changed and uh, chained, and behind them uh, there is a fire burning, and between them and the fire there is a road, and there are people are walking, carrying all kinds of statues, uh, furniture, etc. And actually, the only thing they can perceive is the shadow of these things carried along this road on the wall on the back of the cave. So when these people walk uh, on and off carrying these statues and are talking, it is for these prisoners as if these shadows are talking. And um, they are, well, they, they, they sort of uh, start uh, a game to predict wh which shadow will come next. And also they recognize these shadows with the voices. They think they, these are the voices of the shadows. And actually, their whole reality is nothing else than these shadows on the wall. And then Socrates uh, writes what will happen if um, uh, one of these prisoners is freed and permitted to leave the cave. So first, he will be carried onto the fire. And actually, he won't be very happy uh, to, be, uh, 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 to leave the cave because that is all he knows. So, and if he uh, sees the fire, his eyes are hurt and he wants to, to go back to, to what is familiar to him, to this uh, world of the shadows. But uh, slowly, slowly, the, his eyes um, uh, are getting used to the light and then he sees the statues for what they are. And he sees that what he always has seen uh, as shadows, that there is something behind it. And then um, uh, Socrates uh, describes what will happen then if we carry the prisoner further outside, then sort of the same happens. Uh, he, uh, first his eyes hurt because of all this daylight and uh, he can only see uh, in the night and in, in the evening. And then slowly he gets used and then he sees yeah, the living beings there and uh, everything that uh, life is and also that there is a source of everything that he sees, and that source is the sun, and then when he tries to look at the sun, uh, he is blinded by the light by the sun, so he cannot see any further. So we can discover different levels of um, perception of reality. And if we compare the simile of the sun to the metaphor of the cave, we can see these different um, levels, and of course you have uh, 
in general, these two worlds, the outer sensible world and the inter intelligible world, the world outside the cave. And then if you look at the levels, you could see that the shadows in the cave correspond to the images uh, uh, and shadows uh, outside uh, and the models uh, of things you can describe. Uh, the images um, or the statues uh, correspond to beings, ideas, or beings in the outer world and ideas in the intelligible world. The light of the fire corresponds to the sunlight and the truth in the intelligible world, and then the fire that corresponds uh, with the sun or the good in uh, the inner world. So if you take these uh, different levels, and you can see this correspondence, you can also make the uh, see the correspondence with uh, the principles of consciousness that the Greeks used. And we have here the Greek names. We also put behind it some Sanskrit names for those who are familiar with that. But it's, uh, it's easy to um, discern these uh, with the aspects of thinking. And actually, um, I'm sorry, one back. These are different uh, principles of consciousness, and every being has all these principles of consciousness, but uh, not every being has developed every principle. Not every principle is active. And for man, holds true that we are now de developing the fifth principle, in Sanskrit called the manas, or the thinking principle. And the Greeks divided this manas into three, uh, so, nous, fren, and tumos, different um, aspects of thinking, but it's easier to recognize if we also um, divide it into seven, corresponding also with the seven principles of consciousness. And then you get the seven aspects of thinking. And that is for us as thinkers uh, very recognizable. So, to start below, we have like physical thinking, like thoughts of Naya, hunger or thirst or being tired, uh, physical sensations. Then we have the emotional thinking. Of course, the emotions are well known to us, being angry, being happy, uh, being sad, uh, etc. Vitality. This is the thinking aspect that is really uh, making us uh, uh, do all, all kinds of things, um, wanting to work, wanting to uh, don't don't want to sit still, but but uh, um, yeah, do something about it. Uh, desire uh, is a th thinking uh, principle, of course, also very well known. And then you can have desire for outer things, for uh, nice stuff. Uh, but also desire for uh, more inner things, for wisdom, for uh, more knowledge. Then you have the intellect, and this is the first principle that takes us outside the cave, because then we are, um, how do you say, uh, coming from personal, um, uh, yeah, adherence and... Uh, um, things that are for ourselves uh, to things that are above personal, that are more important, that are not uh, connected to our own, um, our own self. So we have the intellect, uh, for instance, math, uh, 2 plus 2 equals 4, that holds true for everybody. That's not particularly in our own importance. So there you see the difference. And then you have insight going above that, to see the, um, the connection of all things, uh, to see um, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the laws of nature, for instance, to discover that and to work that out with the intellect later on. Uh, and then the highest is the sense of unity, where actually uh, this I, uh, me as a person separate from others, sort of dissolves and we have this sense that everything is just one, united um, and uh, in essence also uh, the same. 
So here you have these, uh, these seven aspects of thinking in our course, thinking differently. We have uh, a lot of lessons uh, to work this uh, further out. But also here you see the idea of the good still standing uh, above, and that's always very important to take into account. Uh, as Plato also writes, in the intelligible place, the idea of the good is the last object of vision, and is scarcely to be seen. But if it be seen, we must collect by reasoning that it is the cause to all of everything right and beautiful, generating in the visible place light and its lord the sun, and in the intelligible place it is itself, it is itself the lord, producing truth and intellect. And he adds, and this must be beheld by him who is to act wisely, either privately or in public. So there's nothing we can achieve or have success if we don't keep this idea of the good in mind. Eh? Because that is uh, actually yeah, the, the source of everything and also the end of everything. And it says a lot about how we can perceive truth. And there's, not a, there's a very uh, nice metaphor to describe how to see truth. It's not from Plato, but uh, from uh, Buddhism. Uh, I think um, this um, yeah, explains it very well, and that's the metaphor of the blind monks and the elephant. And it describes that we are as if blind monks trying to describe an elephant. And every monk has a different part of the elephant. One has the leg of the elephant and says, okay, this like, it's a tree trunk. And the other one has, uh, has his tail, and he says, no, it's a piece of rope. And the other one has an ear, and he says, no, it's a, it's a big leaf. And another one has the elephant's trunk, and says, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a snake. And they all have this, this piece of this giant, actually boundless elephant. Uh, this, this, uh, it, it, it stands for the truth. And uh, by communicating with each other, they can... Uh, develop a bigger sense, a bigger idea of the truth. But we also always have to assume that there is always a larger truth and that makes us always go further and try to, to, um, to get a bigger idea of a bigger vision on, on truth. And that's always the case because the idea of the good is always um, the last object of vision, as Plato says. So, if we can um, take this idea of truth and go back to where we started with fake news, uh, what happens, what can we say now um, about this idea? Can we trust the news? And I would like to have just a small dialogue on this with you uh, on uh, using these ideas of Plato um, in our daily life. So, what are what are you, your your ideas? You need to know the sources. Mm -hmm. And why is that important? And to trust you. you need to know that is uh, the real news. Yeah. To to know. Okay. If if the source is really the source it comes from, and if it's trustworthy, reliable. is that what you say? Reliable. Reliable, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you see it with theosophical uh, vision, uh, you cannot trust news. <laughs> Why not? There is nothing new in theosophy. <laughs> Why not? There's nothing new in theosophy. Everything is there uh, already, so. Maybe. But does it that mean that you cannot trust the news? It gives mm -hmm. nothing news. Mm -hmm. But when you hear something for the first time, yeah. you don't know if it is good or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then go back to the source. Mm -hmm. You can say in theosophy, uh, we, we also have the same idea as Plato, that there is this, that the truth is boundless. 
So we, we know that the elephant is boundless, but um, does that mean that we do not have to trust every piece we sense of the elephant? I don't, I don't think so. But, it, but I think it does mean that we never get to it, the end of it. That, that, that I, yeah, that is true. Uh, we can take the, uh, the example of the cave. Okay, okay. Shadows on the wall. Mm -hmm. That can be a type of nails. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it is just a uh, strong, how do you say that, uh, deviated from the real effect. Yeah. It is something just like a shadow. Mm -hmm. And some people like that very much, of course. Mm -hmm. You can say, okay, it is the fire itself. Mm -hmm. And then we know the people passing by, but you can also go to the outer world and then you see the sun itself. And mm -hmm. I think that are the three levels you can apply for news as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think so too, yeah. 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 But it means that you have to do an investigation for yourself. Yeah. If you are able to see what is the type of, what type of news is it. Yeah. And that is the reason that I call it a reliable source, because you know from some sources you always have shadows. Mm -hmm. Because that is, they give what the people like, mm -hmm. full stop. Yeah. And some other uh, sources are more or less in between, mm -hmm. they becoming more to the real truth. Mm -hmm. And some papers that are really focused on only what is full reliable, only what we have checked ourselves. Mm -hmm and what you can full support as, as it is, yeah? Mm -hmm. And but how do we know if, it's, if a source is reliable? Do we well, that is something you have to build up in, let's say, in a longer relation. Mm -hmm. Or you have to do investigation. Yeah. You know in the heart? Mm -hmm. We also have to, to realize with, uh, with, 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 uh, with uh, the aspect of thinking we are busy when we are thinking emotionally or uh, in vitality. It's another uh, perspective, perspective of truth than uh, when we are in a high intellectual uh, mm -hmm. level of thinking. Yeah. So that makes uh, us think how to, to react on you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have to take in a, into account also our own perspective. Yes. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. But you have also to make a distinction between the facts as such mm -hmm. and uh, how it is presented. Mm -hmm. So the way it is presented can also say something about how true it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you, and that is uh, very much mixed in our ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The opinions and the facts as such. Mm -hmm. And how can you discern between opinions and facts? How do you do that? Um, if you have a good journalist, uh, it, uh, he or she says, uh, this is my opinion and this is how I think yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. And how, how, how I interpret it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, some papers, they quote more sources than just one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and sometimes also opposite uh, sources mm -hmm. and the conclusion is for yourself yeah yeah and can we distinguish better um, what is fake from what is real if we are an expert at, at things for instance we all have our expertise in a certain way yes. yeah so I also heard say then that if we investigate, we have to investigate to discover if the source is reliable, we have to um, build a longer relationship and I don't think the longer relationship uh, we have with some um, news media um, is the most important but of course the, the, the that we can test if the uh, news coming from a certain medium is all um, yeah, um, shows that it's true. And so if we uh, test and test again, then we can say, okay, this uh, we see this is quite a reliable source. So I can build some trust on it. Mm -hmm. 
It also holds the background of the sorcerer yeah. as uh, some uh, person uh, has uh, <coughs> a certain background that he has has a certain uh, glasses on. Yeah. Yeah. He walk apart or uh, but what is also happening very much, uh, people don't say wrong things. Mm -hmm. Everything what they say is correct, mm -hmm. but they leave things. Mm -hmm. And what is left is very of more important than what is said. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, that's also interesting because what is news? Huh? Well, there's always a selection there, of course. Because, yeah, otherwise everything could be news. Or nothing, <laughs> from a theosophical standpoint, maybe. Yeah. Okay. So there, these are some ideas we can use. Mm -hmm.